Good evening. Good evening. So you're all you're all muted. Don't take it personally. But welcome to uh, the latest instalment of Feral Fry Ups. Um, this is our seventh Feral Fry Up, and this evening we have got for your delectation Claire Holdstock. You want to say good evening, Claire? Claire, can you? Hi. Hi, everyone. Hello, Thanks. Claire. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> so we've got Claire Holdstock with us tonight. Now, Claire, for those of you who are hull-based, you'll probably know Claire. Um, you, you'll have seen her at art events or showing work around, around the city. Claire, where are you now? Um, I'm in South London at the minute. You're in South London at the minute. <laughs> And, and what what are you doing down in that London? Um, I just started doing my uh, masters at the Royal College of Art and Sculpture, um, but unfortunately, it's it's kind of online at the minute because of COVID. It would usually be like a practice based course. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> a tricky time to be to be doing that course, but I hope you're getting stuck in. We'll learn a, a lot more about the work you're doing currently during the during the course of the talk, hopefully. So this evening, it's the usual format, folks. So we're here, we've got Jane Jones on the phones to take your questions. Do you want to say hello, Jane Jones on the phones? Hello, everybody. Jane Jones on the phone says hello. I hope you can hear that. Um, so we're going to chat to Claire. Claire's selected about 10 images of uh, work. Is it, go it goes back a couple of years, doesn't it? Some of it, Claire. I think it goes back to about 2016. So we're going to talk about those works and then get right up to date um, to see what Claire's up to now. And we're going to share screen so that as soon as we start talking about the work, um, you'll just see the images of, of Claire's work. We're also going to talk for a bit about um, some of Claire's main influences. Um, so can you still hear us, Claire? Yeah, I think um, I muted myself to be polite and then I couldn't unmute myself when you asked me the question <laughs> about how old the work was. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. Well, okay, so should we dive straight into it then, Claire? Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna share the screen now, everybody. Just bear with us if this takes a little bit of time. There might be a slight delay um, between moving the slides along. So Claire, this is image number one. Um, what can what can you tell us about this? When 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 was was this made? Um, so this is one of um, a series of works that I made um in 2016 um i got arts council funding for a project called periphery um and it was about peripheral spaces in cities um so i've been doing quite a few sort of small scale works exploring um things that i was interested in like brutalism and modernist architecture and then I got the Arts Council funding and I made these larger works. Most of them were made of cement fondue. Um, and this is, this is one of those works. Um, the title is just uh, Hexagon 1 and 2 from the Periphery series. Um, and they're made, yeah, like I said, they're made of cement fondue, which is, it's a type of model in cement, so you can make quite big forms and they're not too heavy. They're still really heavy actually, but not as heavy as they would be if they were made of solid concrete. Um, so you sort of layer the cement fondue with fiberglass to build um, to build the sculptures and you kind of work with about an inch, um, an inch of layers of cement fondue. Um, and they're just supposed to, reference like the kind of the formalism of modernist architecture and brutalist buildings. So when I originally studied my degree at Camberwell College of Arts, uh, also in London, and I used to live in Brixton and I don't know if, well, 
most of you have probably been to like South London before, but there's a there's a lot of architecture like um, there's a lot of contrasts. So there's a lot of quite classical architecture and then um, like modernist and brutalist architecture from the sort of 20th century. And it's like, I think it really surprised me when I first moved to London, like how how all of these buildings are kind of like interspersed and it's all quite mismatched. So then if you come across like a big brutalist housing estate, it kind of shocks you to be honest, like you don't really expect to see it like the, uh, so this was based off of this housing estate, um, which was, I think it was probably about 15 stories high and it had these huge um, hexagon overhangs on the facade and these were like people's individual flats so they they had these like tiny little windows in these huge like um, sort of sheets of hexagons so I was really uh, fascinated by the hexagon shape and that's kind of what led to these pieces. That's interesting so uh, can you just give people an idea of the scale of these then? Yeah these ones are I think they're um, like Nine, maybe like 80 to 90 centimetres um, wide and tall. And then they come out from the wall, maybe about 35, 40 centimetres. So pretty big then. And, and what sort of techniques did you have to use? Did you have to use techniques that were sort of familiar to the world of construction to actually make them? Did you build armatures or? No, so um I could have done them like that but they they would have been like unmanageably heavy even these works really are, are slightly too heavy and I'm trying to move away from from cement fondering concrete quite a bit because it's just it becomes so impractical like I've still got the majority of the works from this periphery exhibition um and they're quite hard to store <laughs> so yeah. um but Yes, I use this technique called cement fondue, which is specifically for modelling and sculpture. Um, but it's still, I think, a lot of the chemical components of it are the same as concrete, but you layer it with fiberglass rather than building an armature. So but I, I guess you would kind of use construction techniques because um, a lot of the first like modernist and brutalist buildings used to be built in a way that the um, there was like a shell constructed out of wood and then the concrete would be poured in and these um I built these wooden shells and then put the concrete in so I guess it it sort of mirrors the building techniques in that respect. Ah so the surfaces that we can see there are they where the concrete is laid in in the mold then? Yeah so that's just um yeah so it's these triangles of, of yeah. wood um which was actually the wood was repurposed from a plinth that I did um, with this like large temporary public sculpture. Um, so I had all of this wood that I wanted to use in other sculptures. And that's why there's these like little um, raised, these little raised dots on yeah. some of the triangles because there were holes in the plinth where armatures of another sculpture went like went into it. Um, but I kind of, once I took the the molds off the sculptures I really liked all of these little details um I could have sanded them down but I kind of I thought that it added to them and it made it made them look kind of old and like that that had some sort of life or like seen seen the world a little bit rather than just being like a fresh new thing mm. Mm. When, when I see hexagonal forms especially if I'd have seen I'd, I'm not aware of the tower block that you're talking about but you kind of associate those hexagons with a beehive, don't you? Um, mm. Do you think that was maybe something they were thinking when they were making the original building, or possibly? But that's kind of strange, really. If it if it's what they were thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but so this this was a lot of urban planning is is kind of strange. Like this this sort of architecture is notorious for the architects not really thinking very much about the inhabitants in a human sort of level. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And this this photo um, that looks like it's installed somewhere. Where 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 was it? Oh, yeah. So the exhibition. Um, I think this is partly why I was able to to get the Arts Council funding for it. So I'd secured this exhibition space in Leeds called Lady Beck, which was like a big old warehouse that um, 
the assembly house Leeds had had converted into an art space and it actually I think it no longer exists as an art space now I think they've still got assembly house but the I think they maybe let Lady Beck go as a space uh, it was lovely really lovely space yeah yeah how did you get them there did you have to hire a van yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think my some of my family might be listening and They've often helped me in the past with large, large works and installs. <laughs> I bet they just want you to make smaller work. <laughs> well, so in our preliminary chat about doing this, Claire, you said you had a, an inherent hatred of the term. Next slide, please. So I'm going to try. Uh, we, we need to work out a way that we're going to sort of nudge on to the next slide. So what do you think? Shall I just go to the next slide? Yeah, go for it, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, this is another install shot from the periphery exhibition. Um, so these are, in the foreground, you can see more casts. Um, these are casts made from the plastic packaging. So when you, when you order um, items or commodities from, from online stores, you usually get them wrapped in these um, plastic bubbled forms, which seem to be a fairly new thing. Like I remember when I was a child, there, there was only really bubble wrap. Then I think it's um, maybe the advent of those is kind of in line with like consumer cult, like the prolifera proliferation of consumer culture and like online culture. Um, and this like strange culture that started to to become like ubiquitous where people just get parcels delivered to the doors instead of going to the shops um so I guess that's partly what interested me in the in the forms and then they've got like this really lovely sculptural shape and like these sculptural properties because they're so lightweight and really they're only made of air like they're called air pockets but um the form is very like very sculptural and They've got all of these like little geometric elements in them and like the repetition and they, they're really like carefully engineered. So I was kind of interested in that. Um, and those elements of these forms um, and then the, the colors of them, the yellow, blue and red is because um, in line with my interest in modernist architecture and brutalism, I've also been quite interested in, in the Bauhaus. Um, over the past few years and a lot of my work has kind of referenced the Bauhaus. Um, so the, the red, blue and yellow are like this, the really obvious Bauhaus associated colours. Um, and also with these pockets, I think, I didn't really think about this until I'd, I'd cast them in the cement. And then I realised that they looked quite like mattresses. Um, some of you will be familiar with uh, Rachel White reads casts of mattresses and domestic objects. Um, so I guess once once I'd made them, I started to think about those. Um, so that's kind of why I placed them on the floor in this in this way. Like they look kind of discarded or like they've just been abandoned or left. Um, and that's what the project periphery was about. It was about like peripheral spaces and the overlooked and these like elements of our landscape that people don't really pay attention to normally like you might just walk past them or you might think it looks a bit scruffy but I was thinking about like the beauty of these spaces um and the significance of them and what what it meant to have spaces like this in in urban landscapes which are otherwise very um considered and then there are there are these like areas of scrubland which are just there's such a contrast I find it really fascinating and there's such quiet spaces and usually you get like little bits of nature coming through and like growing and I just, yeah, I find them really fascinating. The plastic, um, which is sort of draped between the metal forms as well is supposed to reference things that you might find in peripheral spaces. Like you usually get like pieces of plastic that have caught on trees or on structures and fences and they're just kind of gently blowing in the wind. and. The, I feel like there's like quite a sort of quiet beauty about that as well, which I find like really lovely. Um, and then the metal forms are kind of mirroring again, the, the form of the hexagon, but also thinking about these bits of fencing or like the materials of like the urban landscape. 
Um, and also thinking about the street furniture, like road signs or like these like spindly metal things that that exist in the world to like um, as like systems of signs. Um, so when you're when you're piecing together, um, when you're making a piece of work like this, which is lots of different elements, mm. did you? Did you just respond to the space that you were working with regarding how the how the sculptures set up generally, or did you know that you were going to set up roughly like that? Um, I think that I'd maybe done a floor plan because mm. it was an arts council project. Um, some of you again will have probably done done the arts council applications before um, but they're these really really complicated long forms um, you have to supply a lot of detail about the project that you're doing so I think I, I supplied a floor plan because of that but then it is quite intuitive like when you get into the space um, it's really a case of like working with the space and seeing seeing what sort of arrangements and compositions make sense within those space within whatever space you're in um, but it can be quite a shock actually when you because you imagine you might see the space before and you imagine the work and what the work is going to look like in that space and then when it's actually there it's never really as you expected it to be yeah. Yeah. it can be yeah. quite like um yeah it can throw you off a little bit sometimes i suppose yeah sometimes for the good sometimes for the bad i guess mm. um is it it's on the it looks like there's um, the object on the wall behind. Is that some of the air pocket sculptures? The objects on the wall behind, um, it's a shame you can't see them actually, but they're these really long um, air pocket sculptures, which are also made of cement fondue, but they're the, um, the type of air pocket that you can see sort of draped over the tallest of the metal structures, the green, the green. Ah, yeah. On the it's like a, one of those really long ones. And is that, it looks like a, is it a coat hanger? It's yeah, like a triangular like form there. Thinking about like discarded objects in spaces and because the work was quite abstract, I think I wanted those human elements to kind of ground it so that people would recognise it maybe as a space that they might inhabit rather than just being an entirely abstract thing. Like I want, yeah, I wanted these references to, to the real. Um, I think I found that coat hanger somewhere and it had this, the pink thing that you can see tied around it, this pink piece of like foamy fabric. And I just thought there was something quite, um, quite nice about that. You found that on, 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 the, on the way there or on the site or? No, I, I found it. Um, I think maybe in like in a, a building. I think I maybe took it from somewhere that I shouldn't have taken. <laughs> so it'd be in a well, <laughs> okay. Shall shall I move on, Claire? Yeah. <laughs> um Okay, so here, what we got here? I recognise this piece of work. Um this is from a group exhibition that I did in Manchester in 2017 um, in Old Granada Studios and it was with a group of artists um, on this professional development program by um, this guy called Mark Devereux who does things, um, he does like development for, for artists. Um, we had all of these like conversations with various curators and um, arts professionals and gallerists. And then at the end of the um, intensive weeks, we had this group exhibition. Um, and this is a piece that I made especially for that exhibition called Ruin Tree. Um, and I think I was thinking when I made it about similar things to the other pieces. So I was thinking about like the overlooked and about, um, I guess like, yeah, ideas of like what, what constitutes beauty and like how how discarded things can actually be quite beautiful and quite interesting actually. Um, so the tree is made from a cut up, like the shell of a cut up, the cut up shell of a table that I found again discarded. Um, and yeah, again, I was thinking about like 
street furniture like road signs or um like these these like urban markers which are a sort of ubiquitous but um they exist to kind of direct people um mm -hmm. but actually when you look at these like the road signs and um street signs and things they the this, they've actually got like really interesting sculptural properties so I guess I was just looking at, at these objects and like I, I was finding them quite striking so I wanted to sort of create my own version of those um, and then there was I think there's an artist called Martin Boyce who um, has done a series of trees like these trees made of lights um, made of strip lights and they're quite abstract again and I was reading about his inspirations and he was inspired by these architects called um Jean and Jean Jean and Jean Martel I think they were called um you'd be able to find it they they made um like a concrete park so they made as part of the concrete park they made these really large like tree-sized abstract concrete versions of trees and like the the sort of dissonance of that is just so startling I think um and it's really strange I think from from like a, a 21st century perspective to like look back at at people's at the like the intentions of these architects and designers and to wonder what it was that they were trying to achieve with this like brutalism and modernism because it's it's so different from like urban design now but there's something like I think because it never really became fully fashionable. There's something quite otherworldly about it still. It was, it's like almost futuristic, but these like buildings and pieces of um, design and architecture, they look like remnants of like past or like ruins. I was thinking a lot about ruins, which is why the piece is called Ruin Tree. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like, yeah, this, this like dissonance between all of these like ideas and aesthetics and then hanging from the tree um, are these little casts in uh, polyester resin of um, the little S um, packing peanuts. So again, I was thinking about like, I guess, yeah, like the proliferation of consumer culture and people, because I was, I order things online all the time and I'm always getting parcels with like art materials or like things that I wouldn't be able to get on the high street, um, like specialist things. And I was kind of thinking a lot about the waste as well of of all of these like designed pieces of plastic that were just coming alongside the thing that I wanted like what are you supposed to do with them and I don't really like to throw things away <laughs> um, so these aren't actually if there's something interesting about them so I've, I've yeah been... so the, these aren't the actual sort of polythene packing peanuts they're they're you've you've made a cast of, of those and then they look and then they're hand painted are they no they're um the this pigment in the resin so it's, ah. it's green pigment in clear or like translucent um polyester resin um it took quite a long time to make them actually yeah I, bet. <laughs> and I made a series of these trees as well which i don't think we've got slides of today but um yeah i've made like literally hundreds of these packing peanuts and as well I think I was thinking a lot about the process of making them so like being being a single person or an artist in a studio making something by hand in quite a labor-intensive way that in actuality exists in the world in like a mass-produced way and they're just they're churned out by these factories and not really thought not really considered as objects or anything of interest by anyone and then they just get thrown away I think it's strange yeah. and then I think the reason like why I'm inclined to make casts of them with like resin and concrete is because they're so like lightweight and they they are just like full of air mostly um so it was in a sculptural sense I think I was thinking about like what what it would mean to make this lightweight object really like weighty and to sort of subvert it in that way I suppose so did you make other how many more of these trees did you did you make um 
I made four of them, but actually this is the only surviving one. I gave um I gave the pieces of metal from the other ones to my friend who's an artist, and I think they're inside some of her sculptures now. <laughs> <laughs> they've been recycled. That's yeah, good. they've been recycled. And, and so, what sort of scale is, is this piece? Um, I think it's about two meters tall. Two meters tall, yeah. By nearly two meters wide at the widest part. And then it's, you can't really see in this picture, but it's just a, it's like a square cross at the bottom. Did you have to get into welding any of these pieces together or? Yeah, they, yeah they're all welded. Um, but because I was thinking a lot about transportation after making all of the concrete pieces of the works, I, I sort of engineered these in a particular way. So there's like these little welded um, slots so they're almost like flat packed, so they, they go down into like almost nothing and you can carry them like in a car or something and then you just assemble them on site. I like, I like that <laughs> idea of having a sort of flat pack tree or flat flat pack sculpture. Yeah. <laughs> Did you produce um, instructions of how to assemble it if you were ever not around? Um, I actually assembled this one, but yeah, I've, I've, I've sent instructions I often send instructions with works if I'm not yeah. completing the works or if someone collects it, yeah. So this is, um, well, this is 2017. Mm. I think um, your next piece, shall I move on to the next piece? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is, this is 2019, we're, we're slowly getting up to date now, aren't we? Yeah. Um, thinking about similar things again, of, of packaging of objects, but I think I started to think more about the packaging as like, I think before I was treating it in quite an abstract way and then I started to think more about the, the pieces of packaging themselves, if that makes sense. So for example, this one is like a phone charger holder, it's the little plastic slot that that you get in a box with a new phone charger and again it's like it's just a throwaway thing but it's so carefully engineered and it I think I've been thinking a lot about the relationships between the objects that you get in these carriage in these like carrying devices of objects um and the objects themselves um and I was speaking to someone recently about it and they were saying yeah they're almost these like packaging devices are almost like skins for the mm. objects, it's like a snake with its skin or something and it sheds its skin, <laughs> mm. like once it's ready to go into the world. Um, but yeah, I think I just think, I'm thinking quite a lot about the environment at the minute as probably a lot of us are. And yeah, I just, I worry quite a lot about it and I'm just, yeah, thinking a lot about how unnecessary things are and the packaging of, of like consumer objects especially and since you started thinking about packaging do you find um that a lot of the packaging of almost anything uh you see sculptural qualities in 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 lots more things yeah so i guess i'm quite interested in abstract painting um and quite abstract sculpture so when i see these these like engineered plastic forms I see in them like the the sculptural qualities um like this is almost like it's like a relief um but it's like a ready-made relief yeah um yeah I guess thinking about that and like highlighting aspects of it so this one the the pink shape of the phone charger is painted in into the concrete yeah um, but then this, I think with pieces like this, they start to become almost like, again, like I was saying about the, the modernist architecture, like the things that interest me about it, like it looks almost like a ruin or like a, a archaeological find, um, but it's, it's very modern and at the same time it looks almost futuristic, like the slickness of the, of the um, place where the iPhone charger would sit is like, it's crazy, like that level of engineering is just insane. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I love the way it kind of works <laughs> into the, a fossil in reverse, almost a, a fossil from the future or a fossil from the present. But the the, the concrete you've used there is that um, are you using that the fondue stuff again? No, this is just concrete because it's so small. Yeah. Because the fondue stuff is very expensive. Oh, right. Okay. I was lucky to get the Arts Council funding for that project, but I wouldn't really use it ordinarily if I was using my own funds. So just talk us through the process of, you had the, the, the packaging, and then what, what did you have to do? Just pour, pour make a mould? Yeah, it's literally just concrete. Um, you don't really pour it, you have to paint it um, into the form usually with with um casts and then it's layer it's layers of fiberglass again to make sure that it doesn't split in half like fracture. and then you have to carefully lift that off or is, is the original packaging still underneath there yeah you take the packaging off you have to cut it off usually yeah um yeah and then you're seeing this kind of so you said you're you're interested in abstract expressionist painting and paintings as objects and stuff like that. It seems like there's this very delicate um, element of hand, the hand painted that's in quite a lot of your work, isn't it? Mm. Did you, yeah. did, I mean, did you have to, what did you have to do to that cavity before you started painting it? Did you have to prime it in any way or did you just? Yeah, it's primed so there's, um... I'm quite interested, not interested in, I'm quite fussy about the finish of paint. Um, yeah. Because I, my my degree that I did in, I finished in 2014 was, um, was in painting and it was specifically about painting and all I did for those three years was paint and the tutors were all painters. So there'd be conversations all the time about like handling of paint and the way that you might use a paint and different types of paint. So this is, um, it's acrylic and something called flash gouache which is um it's like a type of sign paint um and it can be used outdoors but it it has this really really matte finish which is almost like plastic or like yeah it's like a really high matte finish so, so with with a lot of um contemporary painting painters are interested about they're interested in the finish and it's often like the act of creating like sculptural painting will be, it will mirror like industrial processes, like, you know, like how you might paint the body of a car or something um, and the care that you might take over it. And often it's like processes of sanding down layers of paint between as well to get like as, as, a, as good a finish as you can. Yeah. So it's almost like recreating um, the techniques of commodic of like how commodities are produced mm. and the art, the art um, there's like quite a lot of debates in contemporary art about like the artist's hand like reflecting that of mass production mm. so I think a lot of artists are interested in that, in that. Mm. I think that leads us on really nicely to the to the next piece the next slide oh yeah <laughs> Um, this Where, one. Yeah, again, you've got that uh, beautiful, really delicate sort of handwork painted. Mm. And you were asking me about this one when we had our little call the other day and asking me if it had a title. And this one, I made this just in the first lockdown of COVID times with a series of, of similar works. Um, and this is actually like the first time that I've like gone back to painting for quite a while because I, I was just doing more abstract sculptural things and then I think maybe it was something about the lockdown and wanting that familiarity of, of like being able to paint <laughs> and that like methodical process of, of gradually achieving something that you get like through painting and like through the layers and the methodical working. Mm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we were speaking about if it if this piece had a title. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I I was working at this gallery in Hull, which 
most of you probably know from the street gallery um but I got made redundant because they did like a restructuring of it and with City of Culture obviously there's not as much funding um for the arts in Hull now as there was um so after being made redundant I was working at a Tesco Express which my mum has worked at for like years so she got me a job there over lockdown and this is um one of the it's one of the plastic trays that you would get your cheese in so when you're in the supermarket and you pick up your little packet of sliced cheese this is like the dispenser of that so it's called entitled but I think it's now called untitled um cheese dispenser <laughs> or cheese dispensing tray <laughs> um, and I was looking a lot when I was making this uh, um Bridget Riley's paintings um which she had an exhibition at Tate I think in 2019 at the end of 2019 and I didn't actually get to go just because I couldn't get down to London at the time I was really disappointed but I bought I like proceeded to buy lots of books of, of her works from like over the years and I was really interested in her use of colour because her works are like so simple um in terms of like the colour schemes it, they're just blocks of colour mm. um her understanding of like colour theory is quite incredible and the way that she puts these like complementary colours next to each other is like you know something super fascinating about it and she did she obviously did the op art but then she did um all of these line paintings where it was it was more just about the colours and how the colours would sit next to each other so this is kind of I guess yeah it was like inspired by that and also there's these little um little squares at the top and bottom of it and for some reason that that for me it kind of um it makes it seem almost like a, a thing or a person because they look a little bit like eyes yeah it becomes yeah. like a robot or like yeah there's something about the form of it with the the contrast of those little squares that makes it really interesting I think yeah and it's, it's the kind of detail that you really wouldn't necessarily expect on a piece of packaging, you know, I mean, has that got a, you know, what could possibly be the reason for, for that to even be there? If that's the base and it was full of, it's full of, what, that processed cheese, that square mm -hmm. cheese stuff. Um, and I've got to ask, did the cheese nature uh, make you think about those colours at all? Well, no, because like I was saying to you, I forgot that it was, so I've got like so many of these pieces of packaging that I've collected and I sit and look at the plastic <laughs> pieces and I think about what colours they might become and what, what, how I can make sense of the pre-existing pattern or like create my own patterns out of them. Um, so I'd kind of forgotten by this point that it even was a cheese tray until I spoke to you and realised that it was. Um, <laughs> the colours are literally just because I kind of like these colours and I like to use pink quite a lot in my work just because of this thing of like women use pink and it's like in the past obviously not now but in like modernist painting and like high modernism it was it was like not really seen as a very serious colour maybe yeah. um yeah, there's definitely a, a sort of playfulness ab about using that colour, isn't there? I think a lot of people associate it with a with a light-hearted playfulness as well. Mm -hmm. And also the saturation of these colours, they're not like colours that you'd necessarily get in nature. They're quite um, false. Yeah. yeah. Quite man-made. Um, yeah. So uh, that leads us uh, nicely on to the, the next slide, um, which we wanted to include some of your sort of influences in 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 your research and making your work, didn't we? Mm. So a lot of artists at the minute are making um, works to do with, they're making casts of, of these pieces of food packaging. And I think that it's, it's probably so in vogue because of like these, things that I touched upon about like the ready-made nature of it and um, like ideas of like skilling and de-skilling in art um, and the art object as like be to, being connected to like 
a consumer object or already like a pre-existing object um but b that's this guy um he kind of does the packaging in a really exceptional way and he actually doesn't make casts um these these are literally just the foil trays that you get from like takeaway trays um but i think he's he's quite interested in his work in like composition and um like color combinations again and like abstraction um but i think he just does it so well and you can really see in these like his enjoyment in in highlighting the pre-existing um patterns or like art within these objects that were never actually the intention was never really for them to be out when they were made but I think as well about these pieces of packaging and I wonder like is there some is the engineer or like the people that design them are they sat enjoying creating these forms they probably are because maybe the the job's not that exciting or something and they they maybe take pleasure in the in the forms because when you look at them, the, the variations are so vast, like that no two things are really the same. Yeah. Yeah, you can see the hexagonal forms appearing in a couple of places again. But yeah, they're, they're, they're like, they're almost like stained glass windows, aren't they? Some of them. Mm, yeah, they, yeah, I'd never really seen them like that, but. And, and this is, this was uh, an installation by B Works. Where, where was it? I think this one was in America, um, but yeah. I, I saw his work at, at the Baltic in 2015. Ah, oh, right. It was, yeah. I think it was the best exhibition that I've ever seen. Like, look up his other work if, you, if you're if you not familiar with him, because there's something so outstanding about it. And his name, like some people say that his name, Beverts, is supposed to be like a reference to Duchamp's Armut, um, and it's supposed to be a bit of a, a Mickey take or something. But... The piece is like maybe they are slightly ironic, but there's such a such a beauty to them. They're like, I think, yeah, they they're kind of different to a lot of work that's been made now in the lack of irony, maybe. Mm. I don't know. Oh, it's B Verts. Should I write it in the chat? B I've just done it. I've put it in the chat. I think Jane's just done Jane Jones on the phones <laughs> has done that for you, Claire. Uh, well done, Jane Jones, on the phones. Thank you. Um, but he does, yeah, he does a lot of more sculptural works as well, where he'll do like assemblages of lots of um, domestic objects, and it's always domestic objects that he uses. He makes them all like in his basement. Um, he's got this like dark room in a basement, but he makes these like exceptionally beautiful works that like the balance and harmony in them, especially considering what they're made from, is is like quite astounding. I think. Mm. A good one. <laughs> okay, so let's let's move on. Um, what we got here, Claire? So this is a drawing. It's one of a series of drawings, um, which again I've I've kind of moved on to over lockdown. So I don't know if maybe like the depressingness of COVID has made me want to make more optimistic and playful work or something. Um, but I've I've been thinking like so much about pattern and decoration. Um, and yeah, I mentioned before my interest in the Bauhaus. So there was, when they first started the Bauhaus school, um, because they were supposed to be like avant-garde and um, quite different to any, any like art school that had been before. Um, so it started around the, I think it was the early 1920s or maybe it was slightly before then. Um, maybe it was 1919. And um, when they were advertising the school, they said, yeah, everyone's welcome. Women, women artists are welcome. We, we welcome you just as much as the male artists and designers. Um, and actually a lot of women did end up applying to the school because of the way that it was advertised. And then I think that the, the directors who were all male when it first started, um, maybe unhappy about the amount of women that they had so they created like a textile department to house the, the women artists um and it was run by i think it it became run eventually by gunter stolzel who was she i think she was originally one of the students and then she ended up becoming like a bauhaus master like alongside the guys um and this is this is kind of inspired by one of her textile 
um, designs. So they'd have these like very kind of industrial um, textile rooms and warehouses where they, they would create these, um, these things, but actually they were kind of different to to like what people would associate with the Bauhaus ordinarily. So um, they were very, very laboriously made um, on these like looms that were like hand operated. And they would take so long to make. And I, I don't think that they did mass produce them at all. They were like all one offs. Um, and the, the designers that were in the department did make these like really beautiful, tiny, um, like watercolor drawings for like the arrangements of the patterns and how they were going to create the weaves. Um, I got this really really nice book on on the Bauhaus um, weaving department and yeah, it's full of all these amazing drawings. So I was just inspired by those. But actually, these are these are going to hopefully become like large sculptural works in the future. Um, and the patterned elements will be sewn together pieces of plastic, but I've been collecting these like pieces of packaging, but you know, like the bags or whatever, like the, the thin materially textile plastic. Um, so I've got like, I've got it all color coded and like sorted in terms of like the texture of the, of the pieces. And um, I'm gonna- Will, they, will, will, will gonna the actual will three dimensional pieces be a similar size? So that this is, what size is this? This is um, sort of yeah. A, A4, is it? Yeah, this is A4. So the, the pieces that I'm gonna be working on are gonna be huge. They'll be like wall size. They'll be probably as large as if, if not larger than the original Bauhaus textiles. So a lot of these textiles as well, um, the Bauhaus, obviously the architecture is quite stark and simple. And then they'd have like these really large rugs and these really large wall hangings. I'm not sure if it was to like, maybe it was to make the, the rooms more homely or to keep them warm or something. I'm not sure, but. Mm, mm. <laughs> okay, so we've got a few images left, but this is the point in the conversation where um, if any of the audience have got any questions um, that they'd like to ask, maybe now's the time to think about um, typing them in the chat and then we'll, we'll save 10 minutes at the end um, just to uh, pass those on to Claire and see if um, we can get some answers for you. Um, so if we just move on to, we're pretty much up, up to date now, are we Claire? Is this yeah. work we're making now? Yeah, so this is stuff that I've I've made this series of new work for the um, at the Royal College of Art in first year for for most of the art department. They have something called the Whip Show, which is the work in progress show. Um, and you, yeah, you you can create you sort of create whatever you want for it. Really, it's quite these like art courses now are quite open ended. Um, but this is a body of work called um, Values Last Tango, and it's based off of um, a critical theorist called Jean Baudrillard, um, the simulacra and simulation text, which is like, I think it was written in the 80s, but they still teach it today in most art schools theory departments, um, because he kind of preempted, I suppose, the way that that capitalism was going to go a little bit on steroids, like <laughs> the way that it has done over the past, like 30, 40 years um yeah so the values last tango um i think rather than the content of the chapter it was just that that phrasing about value that i was interested in so it was like baudrillard's very interested he's like writes a lot about um value systems and like mass production and capitalism and he thinks I think he thinks that in capitalism everything um has just become about production for production's sake and the quality or like yeah I suppose the val like objects as valuable is he sees it as like having decreased and like mm -hmm. he speaks about um everything as as becoming like more and more meaningless in late capitalism um yeah. Uh, with like mass production and um, 
I'm reading a lot of theory as well about myth, like the idea of like contemporary myths um, and ideas about like how commodity, like language in advertising and marketing has become almost mythic in, in the way that it sells commodities to people. Um, so I was thinking a lot about this. Um, so I created this wallpaper. It's all kind of complicated to <laughs> explain. <laughs> um, this wallpaper, it was a little bit inspired by William Morris's wallpapers. So William Morris was around sort of just before the Bauhaus really. And he was thinking about like production and the creation of like designs and domestic designs in a similar way to the way that the Bauhaus were. Um, but he had like his own political leanings and stuff. Um, so I, was, I think I was thinking a lot about that and I wanted, I was, I was appropriating a lot of William Morris designs and I think I got a bit fed up of just appropriating his designs and I wanted to make my own version of his wallpaper. So that's a very long winded way of saying that. <laughs> um, in, in our chat, you were telling me a bit about how the names of some of the the plants had kind of affected the way you chose uh, what to include in the drawing. The names of the plants. How how the, it was how names had been appropriated. Uh, I would say it was about like house plants in general. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of of theory at the Arcia that's about um, like extraction. Um, extractive processes about like mining and um, human extraction of natural things um, but also there's like a subset of that there's like extractive colonial processes so like how in the west we only really have like house you know like how millennials are really obsessed with house plants and it's like a bit of a a jokey thing now because every young person is obsessed with house plants and they're like in everyone's houses again um but actually the history of of them is is kind of dark in that they were they were extracted from their original um like native places and brought to this country along with all of the other things that were brought at the time of colonialism um and then the original names of these plants were taken from them and they were given like Latin names. So they were given like, yeah, it's all kind of dark actually when you when you look into it. There's there's a show that I'm not sure if it'll be back on, but at Camden Arts Centre in London about um about botany and colonialism and art and various artists exploring that if anyone's interested in some really good podcasts on the subject as well. So I was thinking about that, but I think it's not really that clear in the work yet. So I'm trying, I'm like working mm. on work. Yeah, I'm so these are the things that I'm thinking about and hopefully they're going to feed more into the work. And then on the wallpaper are these twigs, which they kind of look like twigs in this photograph. You can't really see them properly, but they're um, the casts, twig, the cast, concrete casts of twigs. So yeah, the, the twigs are just made out of concrete and it's a bit annoying with sculpture because you can't really, it's hard to see in photographs what it's actually like in reality. Um, the detail in these, they do just kind of look like twigs, but then when you get close to them, in reality, you can tell that they're not and that they are made of concrete. Um, so yeah, thinking about like the natural world and the man-made and um, yeah, I suppose people see like nature and man-made as being quite contrasting, but there's a lot of theory as well about how um, how we've always distinguished ourselves as very different from nature or like especially since like the enlightenment you know like all the Caspar David Friedrich painting yeah. and like the romantic paintings of like man against nature and like yeah. mountains and um, but actually I think we often forget because it, it's not really in like the way that our human system works and in our languages like the language is very differentiated in terms of like man and nature but actually we are all part of the same thing like we are nature as well yeah yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. so it's like yeah thinking about those things as well I suppose and um I think in the in the next image we've got um an example of another artist's work who you're interested in 
Um, yeah. So this is someone that I've, I only came across her work quite recently. She's called Lauren Clay and she's American. Um, and she creates these, these immersive spaces in galleries um, that feel pretty otherworldly. Um, they're kind of like sci-fi, but also there's like quite a lot of references to like classical architecture or like there is isn't there yeah yeah I remember we were, when we were talking about this um before it's interesting the way she uses um relief and um and and flat she, she kind of pastes these onto the what she creates these wallpapers and pastes them onto the wall a lot of the time doesn't she mm -hmm. and um th there's there's a really interesting contrast between the organic and the the kind of the marbly texture in in some of these these pieces of work mm. yeah so I think she's interested in a lot of similar things to me in terms of like architectural um, motifs and the distinction between man and nature um, yeah so these they kind of remind you of of like abandoned pieces of architecture where the plants are just starting to grow through and maybe taking yeah. over but yeah. also we were saying as well, the, um, especially with these, so these sculptural elements that she's got the wall based elements that you can see that are smaller, um, they're made of plaster and then she's used like a marbling technique. I think she works with marbling quite a lot. Yeah. Um, and in, yeah, in these, the, the nature taking over the man-made become, becomes like quite extreme and strange. It, it looks almost like Stranger Things, I think I was saying, the TV show. Um, but yeah, so many, they're, they're kind of simple and abstract, her works, but there's so many references and like nods to different styles and um, histories and things, I think. Yeah. And like popular culture as well, like it does look very sci-fi, it does it look does. very... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on to... This is a little, this is an installation shot that you've given us here. We can see the um, Values Last Tango in the background. Yeah, so the full installation is called Values Last Tango. Ah. And, um, the thing in the foreground is, it's not that tall actually, it's about, um, it's maybe about 130 centimetres tall, I think, um, if that gives you some sort of idea of scale and it's like hand it's a hand joined oak um it's supposed to reference you know there's like water hydrants that you get in the street yeah the the concrete yeah the concrete and then the little h um sign that's attached to them to like mark where where the water is <laughs> and, then, and then you've got these these inserts are these in concrete again Would yeah these are these are concrete again and these are reliefs um so i've created yeah i've made this mold um with like a i made the mold to be to create the yeah that didn't even make sense yeah basically the reliefs <laughs> yeah yeah and then the, the painted with acrylic and flash garage again um, Again, there's that kind of nod towards um, op art in, in these forms, isn't there? Yeah, so I was thinking, I think I made these when I was thinking a lot about Bridget Riley still. Um, yeah. But actually, they, they become quite distanced from the Bridget Riley uh, paintings that they took their inspiration from, I think, because of the scale and because they are made of concrete, they become more like, they look more like hieroglyphs or like runes or or some sort of um, architectural thing or like something off the ground rather than um, rather than a painting. Yeah, yeah. That's great, okay. Well, I think- um, And then there's a little emoji in the background. Actually, we said we wouldn't talk about Oh yeah, that. yeah, emoji. <laughs> tell, tell people about the emoji, Claire. Um, the emoji is just kind of, so when I made the values last tango installation, I was thinking a lot about values and like value systems and like high art and low art and ideas of like beauty and 
in the not beautiful. Um, and I guess the emoji was like reflective of, I kind of saw it as reflective of um, my experience of the world at the minute because everything does just seem quite crazy. And in late capitalism, we have, we look back and we've got like this really long history of architecture and design and different ideologies and different ways that people have seen the world throughout time. So I guess I'm, I'm trying to like merge all of these things together and think about them in the work and the emojis just kind of nod into the fact that I see it all as being a little bit crazy and like ludicrous. <laughs> And but, again, that those are sort of cast, are those cast in concrete again? Yeah, it's concrete yeah. again. Yeah. Just that, you know, I mean, you really don't associate an emoji with concrete, do you? It's um, a really yeah. interesting combination, I think. I think someone said the other day, actually, it's probably the world's first concrete emoji, which I was quite happy about. Well, there you go. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if it is. <laughs> you do my headstone. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so Jane Jones on the phones. Have we got any questions for Claire, please? Yes, yes we have. Um, yeah, Helen says uh, she loves the transformative pieces you make from the everyday. And she wonders about your choice of concrete in terms of the environment and permanence. Oh yeah, I didn't really mention that, did I? I've been thinking a lot about that too. <laughs> um, and I'm trying to use, yeah, I'm trying to use concrete less. Um, so the first, the earlier works where it's these really, really big pieces of concrete. Um, I just realized like how ludicrous that is now really, unless it's gonna be like a public outdoor sculpture and it's there for like longevity and um, yeah, I, I realized that it is not the best for the environment. But at the same time, I don't know if this is just like stupidly justifying it to myself, but I think like, if I cared that much about the environment, I'd just like do myself in because then because I'm I'm like the biggest carbon producing thing more more much more so than any of these works that I'll make. <laughs> one, if I cared that much, you know, like and also the military and like these big corporations, like their carbon footprint is insane compared to like just one person making a few pieces of artwork from concrete. But yeah, I am I am very like concerned about the environment like I'm vegan and um I'm collecting all of these pieces of plastic because I'm worried about them going into landfill so it is it is quite contradictory and I'm really aware of that um but yes yeah, I, I suppose that is why I'm I'm trying to make works now just from pre-existing things that already exist in the world I think that that's um a more thoughtful way to approach making sculpture yeah, I, th I think Given it's, the way that the world has gone. Recently. I think yeah, it's a it's a problem that um, any sort of conscious artist sort of thinks about now. I think is just this putting more stuff into the world. Mm. Um, you know, it's something that's always on our minds. Mm. Um, have we got anything else? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Helen says thank you. Great answer, by the way, Claire. Yeah. And it, yeah, I, I've had, it's not quite a question, but I've got a thought that's sort of linked to what you've just shared. Um, and there's this feeling about like, the, when you talk about the brutalist architecture, there's this kind of, like you say about this contradiction about you noticing it's like inhumanness. And at the same time, you seem to love it. There's this like this kind of ambivalence about in you about it. Yeah, I think that's maybe what most of my work is about like things that they strike me maybe because because of the ambivalence or because of the insert they, they make me feel uneasy so maybe I make work about these things that I'm feeling quite uneasy about um, and trying to explore them or understand them through the act of making maybe mm, yeah okay, absolutely yeah yeah okay yes yeah. so, um, Sam I'm not sure I'm going to get your question right so we might have to ask you to clarify but Sam says you seem to be interested in the aspect of work from your influences is this apparent in your own work process? As you mentioned, when collecting your materials, you saw an organized color and texture. Did mm, you understand? I don't really understand the question. Do no, you? do you want to unmute Sam? Are you still there, Sam? Can, can we unmute Sam and she can ask Sam? <laughs> oh, you might have to give her permission. Where is Sam? <laughs> Sorry, Sam, we're just gonna put you on the spot. <laughs> 
I'm looking for you, Sam. I'm looking for you. There you are. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hello. Hello, Hello Sam. Sam. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just wondered um, when you were talking about um, your influences, mm. you were um, saying about big works and that and making about his work in the basement. And then you went on to talk about the packaging and how people um, must sort of try to enjoy the way they design the packaging and that and how it's made in general I just thought and then when you said that you actually like Bauhaus and how um it sort of in, in sort of a small industry and then you said that um then yourself you sort sort packaging and materials into um <laughs> Uh, different groups it just made me think of like you know production lines when things are like there and piled up and ready to make mm -hmm. and it, I just wondered if that was a sort of a conscious uh, process in in your own work hmm. I, I'm really interested in labour and I think a lot about yeah about, that's what I mean the, the uh, labour yeah I think a lot about labour um in like mass production and and how things are made um I also really just enjoy the process of making, but actually, like you, you probably know this, Sam. Like the the more that you make work, and especially sculpture, the more it does make sense to follow these like processes of mass production, like um, or like the way that things are made in industry. So you will just you will just make things as easy for yourself as possible, in like having all of the pieces of plastic ready, and then you'll. Yeah, the way that you go about making the work, I guess, is similar to like the way that maybe someone would in a factory if it was being mass produced. Um, just because it, yeah, it's just about making it in the easiest way possible, I suppose. Yeah, so, so efficiency is something that maybe comes into the work through developing different methodologies. But then art in itself is completely the opposite, really, of of that because yeah, if you think about like mass production and the way that things are produced um in capitalism the act of the artist is kind of ludicrous really like it's so unproductive compared to mass production yeah if yeah. you make a lifetime of work even like the artist with the biggest lifetime of work they would have produced as much as like someone on an assembly line in a factory like it's yeah it just didn't really work I don't know if I'm explaining correctly. What no, I'm... yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's totally against the logic of cap the, the supposed logic of capitalist production. Yeah, like it is, yeah, it's a really illogical pro. It's really a logical thing to be doing in capitalism to make art in the first place because you're never really going to make that much money out of it unless you like. There's there's not really that many artists that make that much money out of it. So it is. It's, it kind of doesn't make sense to do as a thing, but we, we're kind of driven to do it through like a lack of logic or <laughs> like, I don't know. We're all mad, aren't we? Well, then, you know, onwards and upwards. Yeah. Any more? Yep, um, Ron Cadry has a couple of questions. The first one is, are you influenced by theorists such as Owen Hathaway and Jonathan Meads who write about brutalism? Yeah, I don't know if I know Jonathan Mead, so I might write that down, but I've read most of Owen Hathaway's books. Jonathan Meads. Meads, we can send that to you, Claire. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think... I think I was interested in the architecture first, and then maybe, like, when I was at Camberwell, one of the tutors recommended Owen Hathaway's book, which is quite a small book called Militant Modernism, um, and he's very, very ideological and very left-leaning and, and um, everything in the book is is like um, very pro-modernist architecture and it kind of met, in, in his eyes, the only reason it failed really is because of Thatcher and the Tories and the way that um, they kind of changed the way that these buildings were being built um, in this country. Um, whether or not you agree with that is like, another thing but yeah I was really super influenced by him yeah and the other question is the design council and the architectural association link artists sociologists scientists etc to produce public work 
would you work in such a group or do you see yourself as an individual sculptor? Hmm. I don't know, it's something that I, I kind of have been thinking about on and off because often people do say that my work looks like it should be like outdoors or in, in, in the urban, like in an urban landscape. Um, so maybe if there was some sort of opportunity in the future and it made sense and I wouldn't be averse to it, definitely. There's this other artist, um, I think maybe I was trying to, I showed you him, Dom, the other day, is it, is it Ed Rusha or did, is that That's the one? right, yeah, you showed me Ed, Ed Rusha, yeah. Um, so he's a pop artist and he's, he's kind of most well known for his collages, which are very pop. I think Becky's maybe aware of him as well. Is it Ed Rusha? I don't know. Is it? Is it? <laughs> well, we, you showed me Ed Rusha, but I don't Becky know. Not if it's Ed Rusha. He wasn't showing me at the time. <laughs> you were showing me like his, his paintings that he did with the slogans on. He did. Um, let me just double check. Because... So he basically was a pop artist, but he also. Um... No, it's not Ed Rusha. I was wrong. It's. It's Eduardo Pelosi. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's why I wanted to check. <laughs> um, but he did all of these these really complex large reliefs um, made, made of concrete and they're very sculptural. Um, they use the language of sculpture, but they also feel very like architectural. And he often like did them on the sides of buildings or like in the subway or whatever. Um, I'd quite like to do some sort of contemporary version of that. If, if I can at some point, I think it would be really nice. Any more, Joe? No, that's the lot. Except how did you get Luke to put a, a screen <laughs> that, that matched your paintings? <laughs> did he have that from the beginning? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there's no further questions. No. So um, I think that's a, that's a good point at which um, we should wind things up for tonight. We've gone a little bit over time, so apologies for that, but it's been really interesting. Um, so I'll just stop the screen share so that we can wave goodbye properly. Um, so yeah, I just want to take the opportunity to say thanks very much for Cla to Claire. That's been a really interesting and exciting talk. Uh, it's been great to, to learn a lot more about your work. Um, you're being waved at Thank from all, from, from from all angles. Um, so we've got another, our next Feral Fry Up is going to be on March the 8th. Uh, it's to be confirmed so far who, it's, who we're going to be talking to. But hopefully you can all join us again for that. Um, if you are on our mailing list, you'll get information about that anyway. Um, but otherwise just keep an eye on our website and on our Instagram. This talk will be on our, we've, we've, we've now got all of the fry ups recorded and they're on our, our YouTube channel. If you search Feral Art School on YouTube, you can, you can see all of the fry ups we've or done so far. Or, or go onto the website, yeah, and go on the news and events yeah, page. News on events. the news and events page, we've got them. And we'll, we'll have this on there within a few days as well. Um, so thanks again to Claire. Claire, do you want to say anything before you go? Have you muted? <laughs> have you muted, Claire? Yeah, I think so. Hold on. We can't have your big goodbye. <laughs> can you? Sorry. Thank, yeah, thanks so much for being here, everyone. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Lovely. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Great, great. And your website is www.clareholdstock.co.uk, am I right? Yeah, Claire without an I. Um, also, it, it's not really that up to date. The, my Instagram is kind of where I post the most up to date things, but the website will be updated eventually with more recent things. <laughs> and my Instagram is just holds.clare. Okay. Lo lovely. Last quick, a last quick oh. question from Paul Collinson. Have you still got his Rain of Barn Barnum book? <laughs> yeah, do you, Paul? Don't worry, I've not read it yet, though. <laughs> right. Well, you know you'll pay a fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lovely. Well, thanks very much uh, for joining us, everyone. Thanks again to Claire, and hope you can join us for the next one. 
I'm going to boot you all out now, okay?